Good morning and welcome to today's Facebook Live about preparing to run a marathon. I'm Tracy McRae, co-host of Mayo Clinic Radio, and joining me today in person is Dr. Michael Joyner, expert in human performance at Mayo Clinic, and on the phone from St. Paul, Minnesota is Carrie Tollefson, Olympian and athletics TV commentator and analyst. We want to hear from you. Please post your questions about today's topic in the comments section below. Good morning, Dr. Joyner. Good to have you here. Good to see you, Tracy. And Carrie, nice to have you on the line with us as well. Thank you, guys. I'm excited to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about the about the race, about the course, about the runners that are going to be there? Uh, it's in two weeks from yesterday, I believe. Yes, it is in two weeks. And I don't know, Dr. Joyner, you might want to step in here, but I just got word that there's 11,500 registered for the marathon. So that's a big race, big day for them, but a beautiful, beautiful course, one that I'll always remember and I run on almost every day. So it's one of my favorite weekends of the year here in Minnesota. You know, Carrie, but one thing people have to be aware of when they think of the course is you start in downtown Minneapolis, wind around the lakes, head up the river, and then the first, so the first 20 miles or so just couldn't be more beautiful, more scenic, and uh, just better than ever. But then you have to take this long, slow grind the last five, six miles up from the river, up, I believe, Summit Avenue. Yep. Uh, toward toward the state capitol and the cathedral there, and that can be a little bit uh, demanding for people who haven't prepared for a hill at the end of a race. Carrie, have, you have run this course before, you were saying? I have, and my my situation was a little different than a lot, most people. I was running uh, my very first marathon. Typically, I'm more of a middle-distance runner, so 1,500, 5K. Um, and on the track a lot of times, so running on the roads was different, but I had just had my second child. He was four months old that week. And, um, I remember coming up those last six miles, Dr. Joyner, like you wouldn't, I will never forget that. <laughs> um, it was tough. No matter, it's tough for any athlete, but I was already sort of, I think all of my nutrition was totally gone. Um, I started thinking I was seeing Jesus because <laughs> I saw all these white clouds everywhere <laughs> I had to walk many times, and I went from running a sub-250 marathon pace in those last six miles to just going over three hours. So, you know, if you run the last six miles about two, three minutes slower per mile, you know you're hurting pretty bad. <laughs> well, yeah. Carrie, but I think that's actually kind of an excellent uh, tip or an excellent thing to remember is most people hardly ever go farther than 18 or 20 miles in their training runs. Yeah. And especially for the beginners or people who've only run a few marathons, it's really important to make sure you have a little bit left in the tank when you get to the 20 mile mark. That's hitting mm -hmm. hitting the wall, what people talk around, around 20, exactly. 21, 22. Exactly. Yep. You know, and, and at least the last mile of the wall we owe to the British royal family because when the Olympics in the early 1900s, when the Olympics were held in, um, in London, the marathon was gonna be 25 miles long, but it was at, they added a little over a mile to it so they could start at Windsor Castle so the royal family <laughs> could, could observe things. So that last mile, blame the British. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Let's talk about those 11,000 people you said, 11,000 runners that are going to be competing. Um, I, I would assume some of them are elite athletes. Some of them mm -hmm. are first-timers. Uh, how does it break down? Do you know, Carrie? I don't know the exact numbers on that, but typically you know, you'd see about 100 athletes that are trying to run under... Uh, you know, 210 for the men. The record is 208.51. And um, on the women's side, the record is 226.50. So typically you see a small, very small portion of the race that are truly what we want to call elite. Um, but it doesn't matter what time you run on that day. Just finishing, as everyone has said, is a, such a feat. But for those elite athletes, you know, they're chasing after a prize purse where it's $10,000, I believe, for the first male and female to cross the line. So there's a lot of money riding on the line. There's a lot of miles and hard work that's been put into it. But just like anyone out there racing, it's a big day for everyone. Yeah, it's a, a bucket list kind of a well, thing for and a I lot think of people. That's what you, when we talked earlier, Tracy, that's what you mentioned is bucket list. So I think you have three or four groups of people. You have the true elites who are, are really trying to set a personal record, win the race, have a payday, whatever it might be. They're sponsored runners typically and so forth. Then you've got this group of people who would be called sub-elites or the age group elites, people who are trying to uh, run a personal best, you know, break three hours at age 50 or whatever it might be. So these people train very seriously and are extremely committed to it. And in fact, train sort of like the elites or, or in many ways mm -hmm. 
uh, do pretty much everything that the elites do, maybe just a little less. Then you've got people that are serious athletes that maybe participate in a lot of endurance activities. And then you have the bucket list people, uh, uh, the people who look at this as sort of the suburban Everest. You know, this is the <laughs> chance for them to, they're not going to climb Mount Everest, but they can run and finish a marathon and put a nice plaque up on their wall and, yeah. and uh, kind of join an elite group of people who've accomplished that. I think they might be the ones who bring the most fans. They bring family <laughs> members and everybody to come and, you know, probably if you're in a lead or one of those first couple of groups, you don't really care if there's people there cheering for you. Or do you carry? Does it, does it matter? You know, I think it matters. It's really nice to hear your name along the course. But I do think the athletes that are running, you know, 330 above, where people can actually get to different spots on the mm -hmm. course, that is so helpful. And it's, it's so nice when you know where they're going to be because then you kind of that's your you can break your your race up so say my mom and dad are going to be at mile five my sister's going to be at mile 10 right. you know all of those points where you can kind of break the race down a little bit can really help a person run a 26.2 miles well, well Karen, one of the things you notice when you're actually out on the course my wife did it a number of years ago was to see family members from different age groups you know uh, parents mm. grandparents nieces nephews and kids at different spots and so it really becomes a family affair and i think it's really important in the current world for the teenagers and the young kids to see their parents and aunts uncles even sometimes grandparents out participating in these sort of events so people begin to get the message that this sort of physical activity is normal and most people mm -hmm. can in fact do it with a bit of training and commitment yeah i always think it's so impressive when you run across somebody who says, oh, I didn't even start running until I was 50. And now here yeah. I'm running right. a marathon. Right. I mean, right. it really has uh, the average age of a starting runner seems like it is getting a lot older it, all the time. It has drifted upwards. Uh, and, and one of the things that's really interesting, because, you know, I've been doing this since the late 70s. And when, when literally there'd be race with a thousand people and maybe a hundred women or maybe 50 mm -hmm. women. And now in these races, about 50% of the starters are women. And, uh, that's been one of the really great things that we've seen over the last 20, 30 years, especially. Uh, let's move mm. on and talk about my favorite part of running, which is tapering. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, well, how do you instruct runners to taper, both of you? Would, Dr. Joyner, why don't you start? What do you say? Well, it would depend on their training load, but I think typically I would say people do 100% of what they've been doing. Then three weeks before, maybe 80%. Uh, two weeks before 60% and maybe the week of, you know, 30, 40%. And especially the last couple of days, I was never one or I'm not one for taking a, a complete day off, but maybe just jog a mile or two just to kind of stay mm -hmm. loose because you don't want to kind of feel sort of cobwebby and mm -hmm. stiff when you start. How about you, Carrie? I totally agree. And I like his percentages. I think that'd be really helpful if we could put that up somewhere for people to see what he said. But, you know, for me, a lot of times, People are really kind of just trying to cr crunch all of their training into not necessarily a 12-week plan. They might only have had eight weeks or seven weeks, and they decided to just do this. So it depends on what plan you use. For me, I had a really abbreviated uh, training plan because I was recovering from having a baby, but some people are recovering from injury or whatever. So I didn't taper that much, but I wasn't training as hard as I typically would. Um, at that time. So I think that if you have a true buildup, you have to stick to the true taper. If you have a shortened, you might not have to do it quite as much as you would if you were doing a 12, 16 week right. build up. Karen, I think under those circumstances, just two or three easy days might be enough yep. of a taper. And, yep. and you certainly you see well, among some of the elites who really do these very hard training volumes and very intense training year round, a lot of those folks, uh, uh, what they would call a taper a lot of people would call the most brutal week of their life. <laughs> now you're talking yeah. my language. Yeah, exactly. So true. Um, let's talk fueling strategies for the race the day before. I mean, there's always a great big pasta feed that everybody likes right. to do. Carrie, uh, what is your strategy or what do you recommend? Well, I think it's very simple. And it's simple for elites and people that are, you know, running four or five hours, six hours even. Just don't mess with what you've tried in the past or for your training. Really, that's the big thing. But... You know, carbo loading is still a big thing, and Dr. Joyner can talk scientifically way better than I can about these things. But, um, you know, I always like to have a carb. I love to have a protein. I like to have things that tasted good to me. I didn't want to taste something that wasn't good because this is supposed to be your reward going into the race. So make sure you enjoy what you're eating. You're going to have a big day the next day. 
Um, and then after that race, I hope you guys enjoy many, many days worth of rewarding as well because it's a big, big feat. Yeah, Dr. Joyner, it, uh, why do it, why do we carbo load? And is there right. such a thing as too much carbs the day before a race? I don't think there's such a thing as too much carbs the day before the race. There used to be this ritual where people would uh, eat a low carb diet for three or four days the first week of the race, say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then try to uh, carbo load. That's where the loading came from by eating a whole lot of carbohydrates. That was found to not be necessary. And mm. basically as people taper their training, just focusing on carbs, but not going crazy mm -hmm. uh, becomes the important thing. But I think Carrie, you mentioned your experience that last six miles of the marathon you ran. And I think in addition to running a, a, a conservative pace and going out uh, maybe a little slower than anticipated, getting some carbs on early if you have yeah. to wait until you feel like you're starting to bonk or starting to feel like you're really hungry you've probably waited too long it, when when you watch the tour de france uh in the summer where these these uh guys are, are riding five six hours a day at tremendous paces going up and down these hills if you notice i mean as soon as they can they start feeding them mm -hmm. Now, it's a little different. You're on a bike, and so your, your stomach's not sloshing around as much on a bike, but, but that is an important lesson for people. So to drink early and, and, and get the, the fluids and the carbs in early. And then I think Carrie made another really important point is use the same strategy you've used in your long training runs. A lot of people have done a program. They've gone to a marathon training class. Typically, there's been some fluids or, or gels or whatever, and if that's what's worked for you, keep after it keep after it and yeah. don't experiment on race day we have a question from a viewer they want to know uh it's after my own heart and i promise i did not write this but <laughs> how do i go from doing a 5k or a 10k or a 10 mile jump up to a marathon uh what would you recommend like on your podcast carrie what do you say <laughs> for people who want to make that jump well, I think you have to be super careful. You have to understand that you can't go from a 5K to a marathon in one week or one month. That You have to be very careful because the, the problem is most people could handle the, the miles. It's more the body training for that race. So for me, my heels are the first thing to act up mm -hmm. when I put too many miles on me. So the first thing I get is plantar fasciitis, and that is one of the most sickening injuries anyone can ever have because it took me 18 months to get rid of. Right. So. Be super careful in the buildup on even just getting your body ready to run a marathon. So for me, if I were to start now, which I've been doing a lot of 5Ks, if I want to do a marathon, I need to increase that my weekly mileage by that 10% rule and maybe even a little less. So a lot of people talk about 10% rules. You know, if you're running 20 miles per week right now, it's really pretty smart to just increase slowly that way. And then once you maybe get four or five weeks, six weeks down the road, you might be able to bump that percentage up a little bit more. Right. But I think, go yeah, ahead, Dr. Carrie. Joyner, you go. But I think the big thing is is really being slow on your buildup into your training. Carrie, one thing I always tell people, and, and this is true for anybody who's trying to set a goal almost in any kind of athletic event, is make your hard days hard and your easy yep. days easy. Now, that's very different if you're an elite athlete running 100 miles a week than if you're somebody doing 20 miles a week. But what, what that means is, is cross-train a couple days a week to keep mm -hmm. the pounding off your feet. I think that's been one of the real benefits of, of the interest in the triathlon. And then add mileage, especially one long run per week. But the day after your long run, just some easy cycling or, or easy swimming or pool running or just nothing yep. is a good way to go and start – because if you just want to finish and if you want to be one of those bucket list people, if you can run a 5K, a 10K, or a 10 mile, you probably have the cardiovascular conditioning to do this. The thing you've got to do is develop the endurance, and that's probably best developed by, you know, the Sunday, typically the sure. Sunday long run every week or every other week. And just add a mile or two a week. So if you're doing five miles this week, six or seven yep. the next week, do that for a few weeks and just slowly, slowly build up until you're in double figures. Mm -hmm. And you'd be amazed at, at how well it works. And then also, Carrie, I think these marathon training classes have been a boon yeah. for people because you get the accountability, you get some expertise, you get some support, and the social aspects are also helpful for folks. What's you know, Tracy, if I can just um, step back in there. I, sure. When I was training for my marathon, I was com typically competing at 5K. I wasn't a 10-mile girl. I wasn't a half marathoner. I went from 5K to a marathon. And one of the things I did do, and I've been doing every spring now, is adding one mile per week to my long run, like Dr. Joyner said. So I'll get up to 10 miles 
And then from there, I'll add that mile each week. And then I take maybe a day, if not two days off after that. So I typically run four to five days a week now. And that's what I did for my marathon. I think that's kind of a nice sweet spot for a lot of people because life is busy, work is busy, kids are busy, but you can, you can carve out four, maybe five days a week to get a run in and especially one long run. So Carrie, I I think one of the things you said, you know, you're, you were focused on the 5k and the 1500 earlier in life. One of the things, and one of the lessons really from the elites, and there are lessons from the elites for everybody who runs is many of these individuals uh, were or are superb track runners. Elliot Kipchoge has run a 350 mile. He's the man who just barely uh, missed breaking two hours at the big mm-hmm. Nike event a couple of months ago back in, in May. And if you actually look at what a lot of these individuals do is they actually train like they're training for an elite five or 10K. Mm. And instead of running three or four miles in the morning, they run six or seven miles in the morning. And instead of running a 15 mile long run, they do a 20 mile long run. So a lot of times, and this really goes back to people like Frank Shorter and Bill Rogers and and Joan Benoit who were training for the 5,000 or the 10,000 and just adding the mileage so they could run the marathon. So I think that that we're talking about very different types of training and huge volumes for these professionals. But I think that general principle really applies for the people in the neighborhood. Let's yep. talk about Marathon Sunday, and uh, our next question is going to be, what's your number one piece of advice that you would offer? And we have had a question come in uh, specifically or for a first-time marathoner who is going to be running her first mm-hmm. twins, her first marathon at the Twin Cities Marathon. Uh, hey. Dr. Joyner, yeah, what do you suggest? Well, I, I think there's three things, and, and, and uh, some of these are pretty practical. One is know where the bathrooms are. <laughs> Because everybody's sure. nervous and there's always lines and things like that. So know where the bathrooms are and make sure you get that kind of scouted out. Two is don't go out too fast and, and, and fuel early, as we mentioned. And third is is blisters and chafing are nobody's friends. And uh, so, you know, plenty of Vaseline liberally applied between your toes, different places under your arms. Uh, and wherever those types, it where, wherever it rubs right. is, is, is could be... Uh, uh, Maybe not save your race for you, but save a lot of pain the last bit of the race for sure. Carrie, what do you? What would you add? Oh, all those are perfect. Those three are perfect. But the one thing I did was I didn't charge my Garmin. And if somebody is that has to use their Garmin to stick to their pace, please charge your Garmin or whatever you know timing uh, mechanism you use. But I do think really sticking to your pace early on and fueling early were two things I did not do, and that screwed me up in the end, and I really would like to tell everyone to not do what I did. As an elite athlete, I should know better, but I did not <laughs> plan. You know, Carrie, what, one so, of the things you mentioned, too, about, about uh, knowing your pace, one of the nice things about Twin Cities is they've got kind of groups with experienced yep. runners leading people. Right with Look signs sign. and balloons and all mm-hmm. sorts of different things so so find your group find your group and 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 you, you don't you hate to say this because you don't want to uh, uh uh set up the poor souls who are, are, are kind of buying the ranch at the end of the race but <laughs> i will tell people that it's a lot more fun to be passing people the last five, oh, five yeah. or six miles it is oh. Then so it is to be true. being passed, being kind of in a death march at the end. We have a question about avoiding knee injuries or any injuries for that matter. But I think a lot of people, especially when we talked earlier, uh, people are beginning becoming first time runners right. later in life than uh, previously. Uh, what about avoiding injuries, knee injuries or hip injuries? Right. So, so I think there's a couple of things. One is, is, is it turns out when people have looked at the epidemiology, there's people who are chronically physically active, skiing, running, cycling their whole lives, actually have less osteoarthritis than other people. So it's a use it or lose it type of situation. The other thing that I like to tell people, and again, this is why I think the emergence of the triathlon has been so important to recreational runners, is do not be afraid to um, cross train either on the trainer at your house or, or in the gym. I mean, if the worst thing that happens on your easy days is you, you sit in front of, of uh, um, the TV set for 30 minutes pedaling away while you watch sports centers or, the, or HGTV mm-hmm. or whatever, uh, there's worse things you can be doing for an easy day, which will then permit you to continue to run a little bit sure. more. Carrie, did you have anything to add? Yeah, you know, it just specific training, I guess, for me, one of the things that I've tried to tell some of the athletes that have asked me over the years is 
whether than if you can't do a long run and you need to to train for these events, maybe do an eight mile run and then get on an elliptical or a zero runner or get in the pool for the the, ra- the remaining time that you wanted to be out on the road. So just get creative with your training. Like a lot of people think, oh, I can't run 16 miles, so I'm not going to be a marathoner. Well, you can still do activity, like Dr. Joyner saying, maybe become more of a triathlete or a cross trainer runner. And, you know, get your miles in, get your minutes in that way, and then you'll be able to do 26.2 miles. Well, so, and, Carrie, and, and one of the things, uh, Steve Magnus, the terrific track coach at the University yeah. of Houston, is using what Steve's doing with his runners, and I think it applies to everybody, is to pre-fatigue people. So they do mm-hmm. certain things to kind of get their legs tired before they're out running. And you can certainly do that on a bike. You can certainly do it on an elliptical, as you mentioned. You can do it on a rowing machine. There's a gazillion water Lunges. running. <laughs> yeah, and, and get those legs fatigued before you go out for, for some, some running or jogging. And then the other thing, and it's great we have all these bike trails, but also uh, if you can find a soft sur- surface, mm. uh, that's a good thing. In the olden days, we used to sneak onto golf courses, but that's not allowed real. anymore. <laughs> Let's say that we uh, have inspired a few folks and they realize very wisely that it is too late to train for this year's Twin Cities Marathon. Uh, but maybe they want to run next fall or maybe in the spring. They think they want to run a marathon in the spring. What would be your advice for the, a first-time marathoner, Carrie? You know, I, I really like running the marathon. I think it's super fun. Um, the environment is unlike anything else. I mean, you once you're a marathoner, you have so much to talk about with so many people. So. <laughs> it's your own Woodstock. <laughs> yeah, but, so I highly recommend it. But I do think just being careful with your training slowly build up to it and find a group if you can, you know, whether that means you actually train with a group or you just have an online training group that you can connect with, you know, through Strava or through FastZack or whatever it is um, where you can actually hold yourself accountable, but also have that team. Because I think that's been really important for me in my training is to have somebody hold me accountable, but also to, to share with and share with my good, my good times and the bad times in training. Dr. Joyner, what would you say? I agree with that completely, and I think for people, especially you know, quote up north here, is is uh, make sure you stay physically active all winter. Mm-hmm. Get out and run when you can, or oh, ski. Running in the winter is my favorite time. Snowshoe, whatever it is, mm-hmm. yeah. get to the gym so you don't get out of shape and you don't, you know, gain five or ten pounds by enjoying Christmas and New Year's too much. <laughs> And then you'll be in a position as it starts to warm up to do the slow build up that we've talked about. Exactly what Carrie said, find a group and, and let somebody guide you through this process. And you should be ready to go uh, for a, a May marathon or a summer marathon, uh, grandmas, or ready to go for Twin Cities next fall. You definitely can run in the winter. You just have to layer up. It's just fine. Remember, I lived, yeah. before, I lived before Gore-Tex. That's, that's all I can say. <laughs> I was alive before Gore-Tex. That's but, fabulous. you know, that that being said, you know, there's nothing wrong with a treadmill. And, you know, even going oh. back to your knees, in the wintertime, the concrete, the, you know, everything is harder out there. So there's nothing wrong with being on a treadmill. The ice, the snow, if you can't get outside, just take it in and know that you aren't wimping out. You what? know, us Minnesotans, we're tough on ourselves but the boy you're so right <laughs> well the, the other thing too is 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 you can incorporate a little bit of interval training very easily in with your exactly. treadmill so you have to do a little bit less duration by going minute on minute off two minutes fast one minute jogging that sort of thing yep. you can do these traditional interval workouts and and uh i like to tell people you know God created interval training and God created treadmills and the two go together. Oh my gosh. We, <laughs> so true. We do have one last question to sneak in here. Uh, someone is asking about doing the Ultra Looney Challenge, which you see these, you know, at the Disney races all over. You do the 5K, the 10K, the the marathon. What do you do between the races? And, and how much time is there between the races? I don't Usually even know. Usually it's days, you know, like one is well, Friday, one is Saturday, one is Sunday. At, at the Twin Cities Marathon, though, the 5 and the 10K are back-to-back. Okay. So the five, the 10K is at 7.30, the 5K is at 9. So that's actually a pretty crucial period for you guys to, if you're going to run it, you need to recover pretty quick or stay loose in between. Right. If it's not a hot day, you need to almost get back, get, get a little fuel in, maybe not too much, put your legs up, stretch a little bit, but then also go back out and start a little bit of a warm-up, 5 to 10 minutes. Bingo. Of light jogging, and then get get through the 10k and then cool down do not just walk away from that race if you're coming back to the marathon you have right. to cool down come out of the race and then go and eat 
have fun and come back and kill, kill that 26 point kill. yeah bingo yeah exa- you just nailed it very good well that is all that we have time left for today we want to thank everyone for joining in and watching thanks to dr joiner for taking part and to carrie for sharing your insights Good luck to all of the runners out there that are running fall races and maybe thinking about running one next year as well. Thank you, Carrie. Great to visit, Carrie. Thanks so much, Tracy. Thanks, Dr. Joyner. Have a great day.